Welcome to the Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tinkser. We at Hospitality Mavericks are here to inspire leaders in the hospitality and restaurant industry to create heart-centered and profitable businesses from the inside out, the kind that both employees and customers love and support. In today's podcast, I'll be talking with Gary and Mike from Not One Bean, a coffee company that only supply coffee which have been roasted and packaged within the communities that grew them. We'll be discussing the power of direct coffee trade with farmers, slavery, climate change, and the impact on coffee supply in the future, sustainability in coffee, and much more about how the coffee industry works. Grab pen and notebook, there are some great and a bit scary insights into the drink we all enjoy so much. So grab coffee and headphones and enjoy. It gives me massive, massive pleasure to invite Gary from uh, Colombia, and we have uh, Mike here in the studio from Not One Bean. I can promise you guys out there, you're going to be hearing stuff today that you thought you know, maybe some of you, but also think, wow, that this is interesting. Definitely going to bring a different perspective on coffee and the supply chain of coffee and the coffee mine in general. So welcome, Gary and Mike. And first you, Gary, dialing in from Colombia. Columbia. Good morning, or good afternoon as it is over there. It's quite sunny out here, so welcome. Thanks for having us, Michael. Mike, where have you, you travelled into London this morning? We are sitting here in uh, the pitch room in, in London. That's right. I've travelled over from uh, Western Supermare, just south of Bristol this morning. Thank you for uh, inviting us over today uh, for this podcast and the opportunity to uh, present what Not One Bean is all about. There will probably be a lot of people out there, like the first time I talked with you guys or heard about you guys. I think you reached out to us. We are our website, and then you talked a bit with Oli from our team, and Oli, he uh, introduced me to you guys, and we had a conversation, and I could see, well, we need to share this on the podcast, but this is super interesting, super relevant for what we are. So can you talk a bit about your maybe individually, if Gary starts off thinking about your journey and then uh, Mike as, bit as well, and then we can combine that to what is not one being about? Yeah, certainly. Personally, I, I came over here in 2010. I've been here ever since. Basically, I, I, I came over initially to have a look about. We have an English language institute over here. We've taught all kinds of people, including people who can't actually afford to be taught from the coffee industry, the children of coffee farmers. And as such, since 2010, I've witnessed the poverty levels over here. And Not One Bean grew out of that, really. So today we have Not One Bean exporting coffee. And our story is a little bit different than most most coffee suppliers. It's a little bit controversial, I suppose. But that's how it all started, me coming over in 2010. It progressed to the situation we have today. And what was your reason to go to Colombia, Gary? What is your, your background? And... Well, I came from a, a quality assurance background. I used to work in the oil industry. I literally came ho- over to look at business opportunities in that particular field. When I got over here, it became apparent that inspection as such, quality assurance, quality control, doesn't actually exist in the coffee industry, which is one of the biggest industries over here. And it just gradually grew into a a personal interest for me. I was traveling around Colombia and seeing poverty. And when I talk about poverty, I'm not talking about people who who don't particularly have enough money for, I don't know, a subscription to Netflix. I'm talking about abject poverty, where people were sleeping in fields on mattresses, where children couldn't be educated, where children were working in fields 10 hours a day, and where up to 50% of the workforce were working without any form of contracts and it, it, it sort of took over it took over everything with me my wife's colombiana we set up an english institute here and we we've been teaching the, the children of coffee farmers but it just wasn't enough you know the idea was that we were going to empower these children so that they, they could enter the international markets by speaking english these opportunities are not available for people without money in these countries the vast majority of coffee producing countries are, are very very poor the vast majority of them if not all of them what am I saying? So basically, yeah, that's that's what it progressed from. I came over to, to, to look about to see whether there were any opportunities over here. And the coffee basically took over my thinking. And we developed from there. We set up the English Institute, decided that we had to do far more than that. And I've stayed here since, you know, this is my 10th year now. Mike, what is your background and, and how did you get into the, the coffee business? On a personal note, I've known Gary for probably the best part of, sort of 10 to 12 years, um, probably a couple of years before we went out to uh, Colombia. My background has come through uh, hospitality itself. I've worked with a few major chains through kitchen management and restaurant management and also in the property industry overseas as well. Um, we also had some restaurant uh, businesses at the same time. Stayed in communication with Gary really over the years. 
And, and when Gary started to unfold the story about what he was actually witnessing, it just made sense to get involved. Things needed to change. I wanted to be part of that and to support Gary and what he was doing and how to take Not One Bean and build the message to deliver it out to the general public, industry leaders, supermarkets, whatever outlets we need to get this message out to uh, of where you know the industry currently is and what we're striving to achieve. What mission are you on? What is it that you're trying to to help the world with? The name Not One Bean basically refers to not, not one bean of our coffee is roasted anywhere but in the producing country. What's not disputed by anyone is that there literally is no value whatsoever in coffee prior to roasting. Now, that seems a very fairly straightforward statement, but when you actually contrast that with the fact that in Colombia, which is one of 70 producing countries, 94% of the coffee from Colombia is exported before roasting. So what we see is that when these green beans, green coffee is unroasted coffee, when this, these green beans are taken away from these producing countries, they're taken away at a price far below the cost of production. Exactly the same roasting facilities exist in these producing countries as they do in, in the EU or in North America or Canada. And we just we just didn't see, and we still don't see the sense in that. We don't see that there's any, any justice in that, that these people who are already, who are in abject poverty, see the, the raw materials stripped from these communities and selling their beans at less than the cost of production. So we set up Not One Bean, which literally stands for not one bean of our coffee is roasted anywhere, but in the communities that grew them. It's a very simple concept. People have certain objections to what we do. We're not particularly popular in the coffee industry, but if we were popular, I think we'd be doing something wrong, given the state of the coffee industry as it stands. So that the mission is to increase the percentage of coffee that is roasted in the communities by the people who have the most to lose. We're never, ever going to get to the point where all coffee is roasted at source. We're never going to get to that point. But, you know, as I say, if, if something like 94% of the coffee that leaves Colombia is unroasted, you know, we're looking at around 1.8 billion pounds in roasting income. It's actually far, far more than the prices that are paid for green coffee. It's far, far more. We're looking at these ridiculous figures leaving these poor countries and leaving these communities in abject poverty. And then we see what we view as absolutely abhorrent, where the very companies that are stripping these these countries of their raw materials, every $10 they take out, they put back a dollar in order to call themselves sustainable, in order to say, look what we're doing in these communities. They take $10 out and they put a dollar back, and the public is being misled on a massive scale. They're being misled. The supermarkets are being mi misled. Universities are being misled. Students are drinking coffees that they think are the product of, of coffee farmers who are who are very happy. And, and I can guarantee, Michael, if you if you wander into the local supermarket to where you are now, whatever that supermarket is, you'll see nothing but sustainable claims. You know, our coffee is this, our coffee is that, happy farmers, pictures everywhere. The, the fact of the matter is that this coffee is being stripped away from these, these communities worldwide, not just Colombia. Colombia is one of 70 countries producing coffee, and there isn't one of them that doesn't suffer from abject, absolute abject poverty. We see this every day. And the simple fact of the matter is that if you, if you went to France and you went to the Champagne region and you tried to convince the French that you should take the grapes from the Champagne region and you somehow produce the, the, the Champagne over in the UK. We have PDO, Protected Designation of Origin, which you're probably aware of being in the catering industry. These things are stopped in developed countries. You can't produce Champagne other than in the region, in the Champagne region. It's the same with cheeses, with meat, etc., etc. But this doesn't happen in the coffee industry. Coffee is often talked about as being the second most traded commodity in the world after oil. It's not. But we're talking about an industry here that's hundreds of billions of dollars. We're talking, you know, 100 million families are affected by these practices. And the simple fact of the matter is, if you strip these countries of this income before any value is generated, then what you're doing is you're promoting slave labor conditions, child labor. Actually, you are having a massive, massively negative effect on the climate climate change like it's like one of the most hot, hotter topic right now across the world Absolutely. how do, can you actually prevent climate change and, and why is that connected to that it's very very simple when we set up not one bean we started talking as i've just done about poverty about child labor as a result of the prices that are paid for green coffee 30 percent below the cost of production in, in in general nobody listened people said things like but we give a dollar back 
and we do this, we plant trees, we plant coffee, all of this. Nobody listened until October 2018, Extinction Rebellion was formed. And it was formed by, I think it was 100 academics in London who got together and started talking about climate change. Now, it doesn't take a lot to work out that if you strip these communities of their, their income in this way, there's no money there for climate change mitigation. And I'm not trying to convince any, anyone one way or the other on, on, on whether they should believe in climate change or they shouldn't. At this point in time, you, you either do believe in it or you don't. It's similar with Brexit, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact of the matter is that temperatures are rising here in Colombia, as they are across the coffee belt. Green coffee is up to 20% heavier than roasted coffee. That's a fact. That's not disputed by anyone in the industry. So if you're transporting green coffee, not only are you stripping these communities of any income that they would have had in order to mitigate climate change, but you're sending out hundreds of cargo ships carrying 20% more coffee than is necessary. People roast this coffee and they're left with 20% less coffee in terms of waste. So we've got cargo ships sailing the world's oceans for absolutely no reason whatsoever. And to make matters worse, this green coffee is then re-exported from countries like Germany, 400,000 tons a year, 400,000 tons a year, is then re-exported from Germany as green coffee to the US. In other words, we've got cargo ships sailing to Colombia, picking up green coffee, taking it to Germany or one of dozens of other countries, and then reshipping this this green coffee. It's already 20% heavier than it should be. So there's already, we worked out, I think, about 112 cargo ships, too many on the world's oceans between Colombia and the EU every single year. And then you've got the obscene scenario where they put this green coffee back onto cargo ships and ship it further around the world, duplicating the same journeys. So not only are these farmers these communities left with absolutely nothing to mitigate climate change. Absolutely nothing. 30% prices that are currently, we're currently at a 15 year low in terms of coffee prices for green coffee. So the current C price, which is the standard for measuring the price of green coffee on the international markets, I think yesterday it was at 97 cents a pound. Now it costs about 120, 130 dollars to grow this stuff, to actually produce it. So farmers are actually planting food crops to survive to feed mm. their families. Then you put this green coffee on extra cargo ships just so that you you know the bottom lines of these companies are actually maximized. There's no other reason. You know, we can we can roast coffee here. We we do roast coffee here. We have exactly the same machines here as exist all across the world, but it affects the bottom line of these companies. And these companies are then reshipping this extra coffee. So we've got the obscene scenario where hundreds of extra cargo ships are sailing to carry this coffee unnecessarily because of the extra weight, and then duplicating journeys from these countries. I mean, the number four exporter in the world in terms of coffee exports is Germany. Germany doesn't have any coffee plants. Number five, I think, is Switzerland. Mm. There are no coffee plants in Switzerland or Germany. So how are they the biggest exporter of, of green coffee? How does that work? When we started talking about poverty, people living in absolute abject poverty, unable to educate their children, unable to, to feed their children. Up to 50% of the, the coffee pickers in Brazil work without any contracts. Now, that comes from the ILO, the International Labour Organization. This is not me making these things up. And this is all to do with the price that's paid for green coffee and the fact that these, these communities, the income is just stripped. It's just taken away before any value is generated. And so we want to stop that. We want money leaving in the communities to mitigate climate change. We want to stop these extra cargo ships sailing with this extra weight for absolutely no reason. And we want to stop these duplicate journeys that are absolutely unnecessary and are just increasing the bottom line of these coffee companies. There's no doubt about this. Uh, there's a passion here. I was just sitting and listening, interested, because again, you know, it, as you, I think you said to yourself, Gary, it's a bit like you are, you're putting a mirror up that's not very nice and we all drink coffee. Absolutely. The majority of us drink coffee and is one of the most growing markets. I know that and coffee is still an interesting space to be in, in in the restaurant sector. I've been in the coffee world myself. So I, I guess this is a bit of a Marmite story, but how does the business model work then? Because I went on your website and the first thing that's hitting me, ending coffee poverty one family at a time. So how should people understand you guys? Are you a, a crazy nonprofit organization that wants to shout out to the world, a bit like Greenpeace that we need to change now? Or are you, are you, you're just a business that's trying to change the world by using businesses? instruments in a different way. We're actually a social enterprise in that all of our profits are generated through business. 
we're not a charity. We we believe that if we were a non-profit, people would simply turn around to us and say, look, you can't do this unless you're actually losing money. It's not true. We're, we're a social enterprise. And as such, a social enterprise is like a B Corp in the US where you commit to 50% of your net profits going back into the mission that you identify, whatever that may be. In our, in our scenario, our mission is, is these coffee communities. We, we basically don't have a supply chain. There are no intermediaries between the farmer and either the consumer or the retailer. There's nobody, just us. We can offer, and we do offer, higher quality coffee than the competition, given that it's, it can be roasted one day and it can be flown the next. There's no negative price impact to the consumer. And all we are basically doing is we address, for instance, we discuss with supermarkets the fact that they're being misled. They're being misled by their suppliers. They're being told that the coffee that they are buying is sustainable in some way. And usually that takes the form of a sticker. There's a sticker from Fair Trade or UTZ. I'm not here to say what we do is the only way forward. Fair Trade, for instance, their premium that is paid to farmers is, I think, 20 cents a pound. So if you're a Fair Trade farmer, you receive an extra 20 cents a pound. That 20 cents a pound still doesn't take you up to the cost of production. So we pay coffee roasters in Colombia between two and a half and three dollars a pound to roast. So we leave far, far more in these communities than any of these organizations. So no, we, we operate as a business. We have no problem offer, operating this way. We firmly believe, and we'll show this very, very shortly, that when you come to university campuses, these students, students on these campuses are not aware of these practices. They are in no way educated on these matters. You know, you go back to last Friday and you see the strikes that were headed by, by school children on climate change. Yeah. You can't tell me university students on these campuses, where there are 20 or 30,000 students drinking coffee every day, that those students will be happy when this message comes to them, that they're drinking these coffees that are causing abject poverty, slavery, and absolutely devastating the, cl the climate. You can't tell me that these, these students are aware of this and they're just carrying on as normal and they will carry on as normal. We've had discussions with the, the UK university sector, King's College London, and I have no, no hesitation in, in mentioning them, being very, very positive with us. We've had meetings with them. We have another meeting with them in early October. We're going to change the way that universities offer coffee to their students. I mean, a lot of these universities across the world, they shout their sustainability credentials from the rooftops and they attract students based on their environmental causes, their environmental stances, the causes they have in climate change, etc., etc. So these universities are being misled by their suppliers. Supermarkets are the same. We spoke with the biggest, and I won't mention them because it's quite negative what came back, but we spoke with the biggest online supermarket in the UK. We asked them how many of their coffees were roasted at source. Their answer was quite a lot, but we'll come back to you with the exact figure. They came back and they said, we have over 600 coffees and not one of them is roasted at source. We're very sorry. We met Nestle at the House of Commons at a, a social enterprise function. And Nestle invited us down to their head offices. We're currently in talks with Nestle and we would rather work with someone like Nestle to get truly sustainable coffees into universities rather than say look at all the bad press that nestle received look at the bad press that this company receives we've got to change the way these companies buy coffee even if it's only a percentage of the the actual coffee that they buy we're not going to change the world with the way that we do things but we can have a massive impact over 100 million families rely on coffee for their income and if we can get these companies to take a higher percentage of coffee that's roasted at source we'll have done our job you know so that's the mission that's the way that we do things we're very much a business and we firmly believe that the current current way has got to change i mean if you look at the fact that by 2050 50 percent of the world's coffee fields will be unusable so now, we, are, we are running one we're running on a time clock as well of to expect that there's just coffee at hand everywhere at any time is that what you're saying as well well it is but we, we can survive without coffee you know how do 100 million families survive if they suddenly have their income taken away from them i mean you, you you know to grow coffee you've got to you've got to wait a few years for it to for the plant to mature before you can pick it you've got to move up these hillsides onto new land how do they buy this land how do we actually do that if all the money to mitigate climate change is stripped out of these communities at the first opportunity which is what i'm talking about you know we when we talk about climate mitigation procedures 
people think that's some sort of scientific means of, of protecting the planet. In, in, in the case of coffee, it means moving up a hillside, replanting stocks. How do you do something like that when these people can't even afford to feed the children? And these universities are feeding these students unknowingly. It's not the university's fault. It's not the fault of supermarkets that they believe what they're selling is sustainable coffee. It's not their fault. It's not the fault of the farmer if he has to employ someone on slave wages, if he has to put a six-year-old in the fields to pick this coffee. It's not their fault. It's the fault of the international organizations that come and strip these communities of this income at the lowest possible way, you know, in monetary terms that they can do. So in answer to your question, we're, we're a business like anyone else. We can, we can provide the same coffee, if not of a higher quality, simply by cutting out these people who are in this, in this long chain, who are stripping this money away without leaving any money in the, in the community for, for future generations. You know? Who is the, uh, the client, uh, Mike, you have on board? I can hear universities are in the, in the talk. We have a, a target market at the moment. Tar- target market is the university, as Gary's already mentioned. Currently, we are in Budgeons yep. in Belsize Park, and that's actually coffee which you buy loose because they've gone down a very strong route of removing plastic as much as they can through their and supply packaging. chain. Yep. Absolutely, which is another part of our business that, again, I suppose linked to the climate mitigation and changing and actually removing and changing our plastic uh, usage, which we can have now develop a way where we can actually deliver freshly roasted coffee uh, in larger volumes to reduce I mean think if you look at a supermarket shelf today most bags will hold between 227 grams 250 grams one kilo bag will remove three of those in- instantly we can deliver in 15 kilo bags that's 60 of those 250 gram bags removed by having it in proven containers which I think we've seen in the news recently gone into some leading supermarkets where they're trialing loose product sales yeah We've got that already operational in Budgeons in Belsize Park. It's been very successful. It's been running over a year now. That's something else to, uh, as a target market, is to, to try and get the plastic issue across to these, along with the climate mitigation of how we can actually reduce the actual storage down. So so you already have like a alcohol and national chain involved, a supermarket chain. Um, and I guess that when people hear this, uh, a bit like the first time I hear it, they say, wow, can this really be true? That Because you guys are very passionate about what you do and the story you just told, Gary, it, it makes you feel a bit uncomfortable, maybe a bit uncomfortable to say, that cannot be true, that this is the real story, that we actually are, you know, not only we are challenging the environment, that's one thing, but I think, as you said as well, it's it's more about that the environment really get under pressure when the farmer gets under pressure because then they start to make shortcuts because if you can't feed your family, you will do everything in 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 you know all the all even things you wouldn't do from an ethical point of view normally. You do everything you can to survive, and that's where you start to tap into the criminal activities or on behalf of the environment or whatever it is. I guess I think from our point of view, with Gary being on the ground in Colombia and the passion coming through as strongly as it does because he yep. sees it daily. Yeah, It's not a story we've read in the press. This is something that's been witnessed by Gary um, on a daily basis. We talk about coffee farmers having to move up the mountains, waiting four years to get their first crop from you know new seedlings from being grown. Yet the scenarios Gary sees where coffee's not even being picked because they can't afford to pick the current coffee. And also, I think Gary will explain, I think it was only a few weeks ago, he was at a local market and coffee was being sold i think it was still wet i think gary will be able to um, enhance on what happened on that particular scenario but the farms are desperate to sell what they've got to get any income in currently and they don't yeah, i so guess they don't have anything else they can go and do in these areas this is the the living no, is the, no what you what you have to understand michael is that, is that coffee is not just coffee i mean that sounds a little bit strange but when you look at some of the biggest problems in the world when you look at you know forms of slavery and child labor etc cetera, etc cetera, climate change the international center for tropical agriculture they're the people that are saying by 2050 50 percent of the world's coffee fields will be unusable this isn't coming from us when we talk about 50 percent 40 to 50 percent of the coffee pickers in brazil not having a contract and having slave labor conditions. That's not us. That's coming from the International Labor Organization. When you take it one step further than that, we have a problem here in in Colombia that there's been a civil war since 1964, and only recently we had a peace agreement was signed. And what Mike was touching on, on there was, I visited a group of all women coffee growers maybe two weeks ago, 10 days ago, and they're all farmers. There's 309, don't get me wrong, don't get, don't quote me on this, over 300 farmers. They're all women. And this is in one area in Colombia. Now, a number of these women are ex-guerrillas. Mm. They were part of the armed struggle. And when we, when we talk to these women, each one of them has a choice. I mean, they're given a very, very stark choice. 
or they have a stark choice themselves. They either make money out of this or they'll go back and take up arms again. And a number of them express this to us that if they can't feed their children, they're going to go back to the, the old ways. They don't want to. And this is going to sound absolutely ridiculous, but I was there when they were putting green coffee together, putting it into containers, and they cancelled the contract because when they worked out how much they were, they were going to be paid six cents a pound for this coffee. And they were told, take it or leave it. And they decided to leave it. So we're currently trying to place this coffee with international buyers. That's just one small story. But this happens all across the world. When you look at these caravans that are heading up to the, the US border, it doesn't seem to make the news nowadays. I don't know whether it's resolved. These people are from the coffee fields of Honduras and Guatemala, and they're being paid less for their coffee than they were paid in the mid 80s. So they can't survive. This is why they're heading up towards the US border. The vast majority of them, they can't survive. When you're talking about an industry that supports 100 million families worldwide, if you carry on stripping these industries of the the only income that they have, and then you carry on devastating the landscape that they use to produce this coffee, eventually we're going to come at the point where, okay, it, it sounds very flippant to say the world won't have enough coffee. It's not that. It's 100 million families will not be able to feed their children and things will get much, much worse in terms of climate change. You know, national safety as well, because if people have to fight for their lives almost. Or... Absolutely. You know, I, I'm not here to say that the, the guerrilla movement was right or was wrong. I'm not here to say that the farmers are wrong to employ Venezuelans. We have a big problem in Colombia now where Venezuelans are streaming across across the border into the, you know, into, I think there's a million of them in Colombia alone and in Peru and in Brazil, there are the same. And they're going to the coffee fields and the farmers there are employing them because at the prices that are paid for green coffee, they have no choice. It's not the farmer's fault. It's not the fault of the coffee producing nations. It's the fault of the developed, for want of a better word, the more developed countries who are actually propagating these methods. And somehow, somehow, when I see coffee that's exchanging hands for a few cents a pound in Colombia. This is speciality coffee. I see coffee that's changing hands for a few cents a pound. And then a kilo of coffee, one kilo of coffee in London, in anywhere in the world, produces about 120 cups. Hmm. Now you tell me what you paid for coffee this morning. Three pound? Yeah, it's probably between two and a half, three pounds London price okay. for a black Americano. Okay. Well, there's 120 cups come out of every every kilo. So it's three pound a kilo, that's 360 pounds. The farmer's receiving, you know, I, I'm just, I'm quoting figures that I see here. And from a wholesaler in the coffee region who's bought, already bought off the farmer, I see coffee exchanging hands at, from a wholesaler, he'll sell me coffee at one pound 40 a kilo. Nobody's aware of what the farmers are actually receiving in order to eat. And I'm aware that people have, you know, businesses have over overheads. It's not just a case of buying coffee and selling it, but it's the roasting of it that brings the value into coffee you can't eat coffee in the green state you know you, you you've got to roast it now all of the biggest coffee companies in the world every one of them roasts their own coffee and then transports this coffee worldwide so what we're doing is nothing new in terms of roasting the coffee and then distributing it there's nothing new in that the only objections that we get we get the first objection is people say it has to be fresh it can't be fresh if you're roasting it in the coffee lands and then frying it or shipping it. This is the big myth, myth, Michael. I mean, if you go into, again, go into the nearest supermarket, don't take my word for it, and you'll see these people who are saying this coffee has to be roasted near to the supermarket, they put a two-year sell-by date on the coffee. So we can't have it both ways. We are either right or these companies, you know, if we're wrong, those coffees that you see on your supermarkets are all stale. It's absolute nonsense. A two-year sell-by date is a two-year sell-by date. The big problem we have is that roasters in the developed world will never, ever work with us. They'll never work with us. They have a bottom line. They have a shop in a, in a prime position within London. They put their coffees on these supermarket shelves with a two-year in advance sell-by sell date. And then they say to us, your flight, which is 48 hours, by the way, your flight cannot produce fresh coffee for these supermarkets it's not possible it has to be roasted nearby it's nonsense smoke and mirrors isn't it absolutely you know, i think you touched on it before gary but some of the largest coffee chains in the world are already buying coffee from the producing countries taking it to the likes of uh, the united states to holland roasting it and putting it back on a ship and taking it to their worldwide brands of coffee stores so and taking it out question. the country to take it back again absolutely but it, then it's going into their own coffee stores like gary said we're not doing anything different those large coffee brands coffee stale as well because they've done exactly the same thing. Although they've roasted it in another country, they're still putting it back on the world's ocean, shipping it and putting it into their stores. It's still fresh. As long as they're packaging it correctly and handling it correctly, it's no difference to us doing it in Colombia and delivering it straight here into the UK. And we can do that 
by ship, by plane, and as long as we've got our packaging methods correct, like we have, then there's no problem maintaining that freshness. And like I say, we didn't put that into, like I said earlier, budgings as a loose product, and the sales are growing month on month. So the customers are happy, and you know it's not something we look at. If there's a 12 month best before date, a two year best before date, all of our coffee is here within well before those times are up to be consumed. Gary touched on it a lot about you know what it goes back into these communities. So can you like give an, an example of like if I was a farmer picking the green beans and sending them off to to Europe and you know we can already hear from the numbers that's really bad business. You're actually sending money out of the door. You have to put money next to the beans to make any money. So you're actually just making loss, loss, loss. But when you start to work with the farmers, what happens then with the economy for them? Firstly because we don't entertain this big supply chain. We don't have wholesalers, distributors, importers, exporters, agents. We don't have any of that. The middleman. Every middleman yeah, takes no... a little cut off yeah. the pie, yeah? Absolutely. And in, in the in the coffee industry, there are there are lots of middlemen. Everything from shipping agents to, to whatever. Our, our, our business method is very, very simple. We keep not one bean down to the minimum number of employees. We use in-country resources wherever it's possible so when it comes to shipping agents when it comes to roasting when it packaging it's all done by the community all of it so firstly in answer to your question firstly we can pay a hell of a lot more than any company out there for the coffee any company and we're happy to pay to pay over and above any company's disclosed green coffee price. We're very happy to do that. We then leave between two and a half dollars. I'm sorry, I speak in dollars because the, the, the coffee market is, it does revolve around the dollar price. We leave between two and a half and three dollars over and above that in the community because we get it roasted there. We also get it packaged over there. So it doesn't cost anything for any company to have their own brand coffee grown, harvested, roasted, and exported directly from the growing communities and transported directly to the end consumer or to the retailer without these middlemen getting involved. We obviously will be working with partners who echo and who believe in our our method and who have the right sustainability credentials. So in answer to your question, it's not right that this money is taken out of these communities in the way that it is, given that it's wrecking the climate. It's having an absolutely massive effect on climate change. It's not a case of putting money back. It's leaving the money there in the first place. Why take money out of a community that desperately needs it and then feed a fraction back? I'll tell you why it's done that way. It's done that way because these labels that are put onto supermarket shelves, these labels that are put onto bags of coffees in, in, in colleges, universities, that that then allows these companies to say, look how sustainable we are. You can put a probat roaster onto a farm out here, and we have them, and you can run that roaster from Germany. It's all computer programmed, it's all remotely programmed, and you can get the consistency that you require. You know, the freshness isn't an issue. We've touched on that. The biggest companies fly and ship these coffees from the country they choose to roast in around the world. The second objection we get is blending. They say we blend Colombian coffees with Ethiopian coffees. And the reason they do this is to bring up the quality of the Ethiopian coffee. Colombia is the number one producer of specialty coffee in the world. That's the coffee that you pay three pound a cup for. So what they do is they blend it and they say we can't possibly roast it sauce because we have to blend. What that's got to do with anything, I've got no idea. You blend after roasting. Nobody puts green beans together and then roasts. All they have to do is change the logistics a little bit. Everybody's happy. We have coffee. Instead of having 50% of the world's coffee fields being desolate before 2050 because of climate change, it's addressed, it's mitigated. You can't tell me that if you're making 360 pounds out of a kilo of coffee, you can't afford to leave a larger percentage. And we've got a long way to go. 94% of the Colombian coffee is, is taken as green coffee. We've got a long way to go before people say, well, we're losing jobs in the UK, etc., etc." You know, there's a long way to go to fairness. They're the objections, freshness, and then they put a two-year sell-by date on their own coffee. Blending, it's blended after roasting. It doesn't matter where you blend. And coffee is currently at a 15-year low. Yesterday, it was trading at 97 cents a pound. And I guess that's um, a benefit for, if you like, you know, have if you set as the, the company that wants to buy coffee from a cost point of view, because there's been, you know, if it's retail or restaurants, we have to had and we are in this uh, perfect storm, and you know, everybody is talking about rising costs on staff, food property has been a big issue is now calming down a bit in the uk but you still see the whole coffee chain 
uh, movement growing. So coffee shops are going to be a part of the, the high street, and especially specialty coffee is a growing market. And, and I think in right now they expect over the next couple of years there's an 8% growth just in, you know, uh, spender on coffee outside your home. And I guess that it's not the, the cost then of coffee that is the issue and actually you could actually say that there could be something about you know having a different approach to understanding how you actually could leverage you know not only you know your own business with telling the right story but also you actually put money in the back in the right place in a way as well is that what you're saying as well absolutely we have no problem if other people come and duplicate what we're doing. We'd love a lot of these companies to say, yep, we're going to roast our coffee at source. There's no objection to that whatsoever. When we transport our coffees, we transport them in something called Grain Pro, which the vast majority of the industry does, it's hermetically sealed. I mean, this is the obscenity of it all. Those Grain Pro bags are more expensive than the farmers are paid for the coffee. The storage. The, the storage. storage. So then when you see it has these coffee bags where it says coffee from Colombia. Yes. Uh, and what they do is they transport them in these big, big sacks yeah. with, with the plastic liners. It's all hermetically sealed. The farmers can't afford to buy these bags because they, they cost more than the price of, that they're getting for the green coffee. So what we do is when our supermarkets, when they, when they finish with these plastic bags, we take them back and we distribute them to the farmers free of charge. So that the farmers can then say, look, at all my coffee hermetically sealed and hopefully they get better prices for, for, the, for the coffee. We are ha- actually happy to work with other companies and bring them towards our, our way of thinking. But it's only since we started talking about climate change and the implications that anyone has even listened to us. It's only since Extinction Rebellion have started advocating for the boycott of certain companies and protesting that these companies have started listening and started worrying about what's going to happen when this story comes out. But rather than take, you know, a very militant view and say, you know, we're going to go up in competition with you guys, we can provide these companies with the right type of PR, the right type of story, and we can prove what we're saying. You you see coffees coming on the market now utilizing blockchain technology. It's something that's sort of close to my heart coming from a quality assurance background where everything was traceable in the oil industry. You had to trace everything and be able to verify the safety and the, and, and the, the suitability of a particular material. It doesn't happen in the coffee industry. And with blockchain, all you're doing is just publicizing. You're just showing where the coffee comes from. It doesn't change anything unless the stakeholders in that particular blockchain uh, are moved from the developed country to the coffee communities themselves. If you can physically show that your coffee was roasted in the community, that it was packaged in the community, and that that money stayed there, and that money was used for climate mitigation. Where, where's the downside to that? But the I, downside uh, is the bottom line of these companies. That's the top one. But there's nobody else, you know. But I guess technology can also help us to understand more how the world is connected because sometimes it's so complex. You know, we watch things on TV. You know, especially climate change and you know economics. You know, often you know in our everyday life we are just busy. You know, running our lives in a way, and sometimes all these complex things. Because we, what you're telling us here is like a super complex thing, and there will probably be people sitting out there saying that these guys are, you know, they're absolutely crazy. They don't know what they're talking about and i can see you are you are you're reflecting something where there's a lot of other people's you know life and income you know your their bottom line is on stake maybe and maybe they already know it's just a question of time where my business model is obsolete because it's going to be transparency like the internet has given us a certain transparency and more and more information we get we will find out that the things we believe they worked as we thought but they don't and then we actually get very disappointed and if you guys were like giving advice to let's say um, I'm a CEO of a, a larger coffee chain and I want to do the right thing what should I do besides like I can listen and be inspired about what you you guys are doing but if in a way I'm afraid from a supply chain because in the end of the day the, the success of the CEO is that sales stays in the stores and able to supply things is 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 the way of you doing things will that be efficient enough to actually deliver the demand and supply it as needed to serve, you know, in the U- just in the UK, 25,000 plus coffee shops. Well, in answer, in answer to, to, to your question, we're not doing anything different, Michael. We, we aren't doing anything different than the leading coffee companies in the world. Everybody roasts coffee. Everybody. The biggest companies in the world, what they do is they, they roast in a particular country, number one coffee company in the world. I want, I, you know, I, I'm not here to, to, to put anyone down, but they roast in Amsterdam to supply the whole of Europe. They roast in the US to supply all the US and Canada. So what we're doing is that there's nothing different than what we're doing. When you touched on it, you said it's quite a complex subject. It's actually not. We have a choice here. We either carry on the way we are 
at which point 50% of the world's poppy fields and 100 million families will be devastated. It's very simple. The International Centre for Tropical Agriculture state that as a matter of fact. So we can carry on the way we are. It's very, very simply, just carry on. Don't change anything. To change those things, it's not complex either. The, the coffee industry has a responsibility here. Why, why are we shipping 20% of the world's coffee around the world for no reason at all? Why are we doing that? It's very easy to stop that. Just roasted sauce. And 20% of the world's coffee doesn't go into cargo ships. Why are we duplicating these journeys? Why are we sending 400,000 tons of green coffee from Germany to the United States every year? Why are, we, why are we doing that? Germany doesn't grow coffee. So these are not complex problems. They're only complex. They only become complex when these companies step in and try and offer arguments rather than say, well, it'll impact on our profits. There's nothing else to talk about. Everybody knows the company has to do profit. But it, again, it's about sat satisfying the investor instead of the communities and the planet we're on, I guess, as well. We're not looking to change the world in terms of all coffee should be roasted with sauce. I'll tell you where we're getting the most traction, China. They say that within the next 10 years, China will want to buy 50% of the world's coffee. Yeah, and that's a, oh. like, you can see Starbucks being very active there. And this is a yes. super, I know from, from other people, investors and especially thing, they actually, they're thinking about how do I take the European coffee concept and follow Starbucks in in that wind out there yeah. because you know we we're quite good at developing concepts in the Western world and take them out to to China. That's definitely something I can see that they they will probably be the big largest market in the world very quickly. And if 50% of the world's coffee fields are devastated, where's this coffee going to come from? We have a couple of guys who they have a distribution agreement with us in, in China. We are getting more traction from China because Chinese coffee shops and supermarkets are saying to us is that the idea of coffee being roasted elsewhere besides China is very attractive to them. The press that they receive right now, you know, with carbon emissions, etc., they don't want to, to make that worse. So they're very happy to talk to us about this and to discuss with us how they can increase their markets, how they can buy coffee that gives them an edge in terms of PR over the rest of the world who are buying coffee. Now, that's pretty shameful when you think about it, that in Europe and the US and Canada, we are having to fight like we are. And in China, they're saying, of course, that makes sense. We benefit from the PR that's generated as a result of that. And secondly, we don't have to issue individual licenses to hundreds or thousands of, of coffee shops to roast coffee on the high streets and all the emissions and all the rest of it and all the environmental concerns that go with that. That's before we talk to them about climate change. The fact that we can take hundreds of, of cargo ships off the world's ocean. That's before we talk about that. This might sound a little strange. We're a social enterprise, but I can tell you that every single social enterprise in the UK sells these coffees, these coffees that are produced in the way that we, we're talking about, where, where the income is stripped from these communities and, and green coffee, heavier green coffees put on unnecessary cargo ships. Every social enterprise sells these coffees, but they've got a label that says social enterprise. A lot of them don't know. They buy from distributors in the UK, so they don't know. Consumers buy these coffees. Every single B Corp in the US who are the, the American equivalent of social enterprises in the UK, they sell these coffees. But again, they don't know. Their suppliers say, no, this is sustainable. And then the supermarkets, they're all committing themselves to a zero rated carbon footprint. And what they say is, yes, we're zero rated, but we don't actually take into account how the coffee arrives. That's the supplier's responsibility. Well, the regulators, the people who are, who are handing out these zero ratings to supermarkets and to universities, they're going to be made aware of this very, very shortly. They can't just say it's got a fair trade label on, so we think that's enough. In general, like when you look at the world situation, I think everything is catching up with us, isn't it? Like the the way we have done business, how we've done things for many, many years, there's been a lot of profit maximization. We can see in general, in many areas of business, things are changing. And I think we, we, we can feel a need for change. There's a bit of revolution happening around the world and climate change is right now running that. But if you guys should, uh, if uh, I don't know, maybe Mike could say, tell us a bit about what is the plan for Not One Bean very shortly in, in the next couple of years, besides like you are on a mission to, to educate people People better and taking more families out of coffee poverty in a way what is your your roadmap i guess you have a bit of a, a plan of what you want to achieve and, and and how you want to transform the world in a way absolutely of course to achieve our, our mission it does come down to us generating sales mm. to multiple markets that are available out there to us so our initial you know plans from now are to one expand our message to give people the option to actually buy coffee that's been produced our way. If we can't give them a choice, it's not going to change. If you've only got one type of coffee that's produced on a shelf and not ours, we can't ask the consumer to buy it because it's not existing. We need the support from hospitality industry, retail industries to listen to our message, to take on our coffees so we can then push them out and actually show the impact 
real time impact of what it's having over a period of time. I think if you touched on earlier where it says on our website, one family at a time, because we have to start at the beginning. Yeah. We can't take the world on in one go. We have to start at the bottom, the grassroots, and build it up over a period of time. You touched on the climate mitigation, climate change. Again, it's not just our industry. The whole world's listening right now. And we all have to do something for the future. I think one of our sort of emphasis is, is getting this our story out to the younger generation because they're the ones that are being listened to in the world today. I've had experiences where I've tried to explain something and somebody much younger than me has explained it and they've got more reaction than what I have because they're being listened to right now. It's their planet. Yes, yeah, their planet. We only borrowed it for the time we're here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When we've gone, do we want to leave it for a mess for them? Mm. Well, they don't want it to be a mess, so we just have to go stage by stage of getting the message out. People understand the message. It's not just about us shouting about it and not doing anything. It's about creating a strong brand image around our mission. The coffee that's in our bags, we're confident. We know that it's high grade. We know that it's enjoyed by the people who have already purchased our coffees. So on, on the quality side of it, we're happy. Everything is graded. It's supported by grading certificates before it's dispatched. So we know exactly what's left. So from a consumer point of view, we've got a product that can be enjoyed, but it's got to be made available. And we want leading industries to make that available as well. And it is difficult to get to them, but like Gary touched on earlier, we have spoken to Nestle. We've spoken to them twice. At one point we thought, do we deal with Nestle? Are they too big? They're too, they're too negative. Too many negative stories. But actually, if we can do something with a company of that size organisation, we can change through the volume that they, they purchase and impact lives a lot quicker by larger industries actually listening to us as well and just changing some of their methods. There's lots of target markets that they don't touch that they can probably quite easily tap into, utilising our message that gives them a better credential and showing the impact that can be done just through what our, our mission is. I guess, you know, we've heard, you know, the brutal facts and you say that we can't do this alone we also need people out there the operators uh, the retail chains the, the hospitality industry to be part of this journey in a way if we said it was a bit like we started on a positive note and then we've been through you know walk through the, the, the valley of death almost what is the positive thing you see mike out there right now that's happening in in, in the coffee industry is there any like positive signs besides that you know there's there's some very big challenges ahead for in general coffee i think the positive side of it is that the coffee consumption is still growing so there's still going to be a continuous market that's growing for the need for the product so that's the positive side but to meet that positivity of a growing market we've got to create it sustainably at the other end so it does like you say you've got the up and down of the side story but they go hand in hand we've got a growing market people enjoy coffees speciality market you touched on earlier is growing and it not just in the uk gary touched on china it's about quality they, mm. want, they want the best yeah so they are getting on the the same wave as we have been uh, absolutely yeah. so the future of coffee looks good from a forefront but we have to maintain that through what we do if we can impact and create those farms that are productive profit making able to increase their land to mitigate the climate change by moving higher up the mountain. Obviously, they've got the time to wait for the fresh crops to come in. If their previous land then is affected by the climate change where they can't grow it, it could still be available to another type of crop so that they can then change, you know, and have two two different markets. But it's about empowering those farmers to have a knock-on effect. We had one farmer, uh, I think it was Lewis from Sosima, he empowers other farmers where he can now help roast their coffees because he's got the equipment to do it. And because there are a lot of small holders around him, he can increase the value to them. So although they might not have the raw materials to actually produce a roasted product he now has he's made a profit he's making a successful business he can then pass that down onto the small holders by bringing their coffees in through his operation and make that yeah, coffee more, yeah. more widely available so it's like circular economy in a way in this journey it sounds like you have had um, like any entrepreneur a lot of rejection how do you keep yourself going what is the, the light that keeps you know you united and you know operating you know mike you're here in the uk gary out in Colombia. what does that make you get out of bed every day and actually get the energy to keep on fighting the windmills if we could use that way of looking at it from a Colombian perspective if we can take children out of fields and we can stop slave labor being the only means of picking this coffee and we can be a definite positive influence on climate change if if you have those things if you can see those things you don't really need much more motivation than that cambridge university right now they have an internal investigation ongoing to see how much money they benefited from how they benefited from the slave trade and then they're going to pass resolutions as to whether they recompense various parties you know 1719 the richest people in britain slave owners planters you know in 2019 300 years later 
we hear from the International Labour Organization that 40 to 50 percent of coffee pickers in the world's biggest coffee producing nation, Brazil, don't have contracts. In other words, they're working in slave labour conditions. So it doesn't take a lot of motivation, to be honest with you. It's the other way. It, it, it's how, how can people ignore this? How can supermarkets advertise sustainable coffees everywhere you look? How, how can universities serve these coffees to the students? the very students that are taking part in Extinction Rebellion protests. So the actual motivation, it's not money. It's not money. We could we could buy green coffee and make a lot of money. I'm here, you know, I've been here for 10 years. It's nothing to do with money. It's very easy to get motivated when you see six-year-old children working in fields. It doesn't take any motivation. I mean, there are times where I look at this and I wish I could just turn the other cheek. It'd be lovely if, if, if what these people were saying was true. This sustainable coffee that you see in every supermarket was actually sustainable. It's not. So motivation really isn't an issue. It's not an issue for anyone who comes out here and sees what we're doing. It's not an issue when people taste our coffee and it's not an issue when we prove that our method works, that we can see a physical change in these communities purely and simply as a, re as a result of fair prices being paid for coffee and far more of that coffee being roasted and produced at source. The issue is news comes very fast nowadays. We live in a very strange age. Fake news is everywhere. Journalists are always looking for the next new thing when it's just a constant a constant grind of poverty, slavery, child labor. These aren't stories that make the headlines. But also when it's a bit start... uncomfortable, so why wouldn't you want Absolutely. to face it? We... Like, there's normally, yeah, no, we... normally people don't like to face the brutal facts, I says. Yeah. We, we're not popular at all in the coffee industry. In fact, you know, we, we are very, very unpopular. We'd rather be unpopular and do the right thing than popular and line our own pockets. And that sounds very holy than thou, but it's it's a fact. What about you, Mike? Do you have anything to add? What I don't do is, is see it day to day together. Yeah. But what I do do is I wake up every day and I want to make a difference before my last day. We yeah. touched on it, we're here for a certain period of time. I want to know that I've done something to empower others that aren't or won't have had a privileged upbringing that I might have had, giving something back. I, I've worked in industries where I've had, had good salaries and before not taking consideration of climate change, where my coffee came from, where my chocolate bar was produced. Like Gary touched on before, there aren't any coffee plants in Germany. There's no chocolate growing in Belgium. No. You know, it's that scenario, but you, your mind doesn't yeah. always think that way no. of, of a product. And where does the cow come from? <laughs> exactly. I think as this story grew and, and working with Gary and hearing, seeing the videos that he's recorded and witnessing it through there, I, I think in the stage of life I'm at now, to be able to empower others and give something back. And like Gary said, it's not all about money. It's, it's, it's about empowering others to, to continue in this world. And I, if I leave that behind, great. In the end of the podcast, we always ask the, the guests or the guests, now we have guests today, to give one advice and one advice only. And uh, do you two guys, I would say you have about 20, 30 seconds to give one advice to people out there. And it could be general advice it doesn't have to be connected to coffee or anything but what will you give advice to you know leaders and entrepreneurs and people within the hospitality and restaurant industry with this big part of our community and listening to that what advice would uh, you give them mike uh, for me looking at taking more notice of their supply chain of where things really really come from and are their supply chain doing things to help mitigate the problems of the world today before just accepting that it's got a label to say that it's okay so I ask why 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 absolutely yeah yeah and you gary what would your advice been my advice would be not to listen to us not to listen to not one being as has been in the news recently with extinction rebellion and with greta thunberg you have to listen to the scientists people like the ilo international labor organization and the people that are publishing reports showing that what we are saying is true you know 76 percent of adult americans drink coffee it's more popular than tap water it's a 225 billion dollar industry and yet we have farmers who have to plant food crops to feed the families now it doesn't take much more than that ask where your coffee comes from by all means but ask whether it was roasted at source ask whether it was put on cargo ships as heavy green beans and then ask why Just ask why that's the situation. And no matter what labels you see on a, a bag of coffee, if those conditions are not adhered to, if it's not roasted at source, the income was stripped from these communities at the first opportunity. If it's not roasted at source, it's transported as green coffee, 20% heavier than it should be. And there are hundreds of cargo ships sailing today, unnecessarily duplicating journeys. Just ask why.
asked why that's a situation and how how that translates to sustainable coffee. Good. It was difficult for Gary to to keep the thirty second rule, wasn't it? Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. No, that's fine. Gary and Mike, it's been a big pleasure to again to have this conversation. And there's no doubt about there's definitely a challenge out there, and I'm sure that there will be people reacting on this as they listen in. And where 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 can they go and find stuff about not one bean? Where where do you find your what is, what is your website called and what What kind of channels is there to get in contact with you? We've got our website, which is quite straightforward, notonebean.com. You will find us again under Not One Bean on social media such as Facebook. All our contact details are readily available across any of our media sites. We have YouTube channels out there as well. So yep. put into your search yeah. engine, Not One Bean. Not Number one, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. If you, and if you put that in Not One Bean YouTube, you'll find plenty of material there. Uh, that Gary's produced. People can actually call me on my mobile as I'm on these coffee fields. So anybody, anybody that wants to talk to me personally, I'm I'm more than willing to speak to anyone. And and you know, I'd like to say thank you, Michael, because it's people like yourself inviting us onto onto things like this that is going to get the message out. You're welcome, because uh, you know the podcast is all about changing the way we see things, and we we dare to be different and think in different ways, and actually unlock Pandora's box sometime by asking why, why, why. That's one of the philosophies about what we about as well Gary and Mike thank you very much for your time Gary thank you for joining us from Colombia and I'm sure we're going to hear more about you guys as we we move forward I know there's a lot of things coming in the future as well from you guys so uh, yeah thank you very much for your time today and thank you for coming on the Hospitality Maverick podcast thank you Michael thank you thank you Thank you, Gary and Mike, for sharing your insights about the coffee trade and the impact it has on people and planet. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please give us a like, share, rate, or subscribe to one of our channel. Thank the Let's Talk video production for your help and support. We hope you enjoyed today's Hospitality Maverick podcast with me, Michael Tingsa. Tune in next time for another interview. And in the meantime, find out more about us and subscribe to our newsletter at hospitalitymaverick.com. Thanks for listening and be maverick.